at Beacon, you'll be welcome. You show your true colors. So Vic, you yes. have uh, you have had a long history at Beacon, but you've had a long history of Unitarian Universalism that that started before you even came to Beacon. Can you talk about how you even first walked into a Unitarian Universalist place? Well, I had a secular Jewish background. Um, Gretchen, my wife, was Methodist. And the rabbi at our temple up in Albany, New York, where we were together for the first time, she was 18 and I was 21. Um, we, um, that's not when we got married. We had a five-year courtship, but uh, the rabbi in my temple wouldn't even talk to us, even though Gretchen was willing to convert. So someone suggested a Unitarian church. So I put my three-piece suit on and Gretchen got all dialed up and we went to the minister's office. His name was Nicholas Cardell. And we sat down in his office and I said, excuse me, sir. I said, shall I call you Reverend or Mr? And he said, call me Nick. And from that time up till the present, we've been Unitarians. <laughs> so all it took was a, a, a reduction in, in uh, status uh, when we first met and uh, we were just two, two people, three people talking to one another. So we were married in that church in, in Albany and uh, moved to Rochester, New York, where Gretchen and I were both active. In 1979, came down to the Summit Church and um, both Gretchen and I are former uh, presidents of the board of trustees of the Summit Unitarian Church. And we found a very comfortable home here. So that's that's my story. And um, so this is that you came down to New Jersey um, right around the same sort of time as this song was really getting going. Oh. Uh, you know, around the time that it was written and uh, before Cindy Lauper kind of made it uh, very famous. But what was uh, the Summit Church like at that time? It was old and white. <laughs> Okay, are you talking about the building or the people? <laughs> no, both, both. Yeah, it was a very conservative uh, for, for Unitarian churches. Uh, it was pretty conservative. Um, every Unitarian church that I have been to is a direct reflection of the, the minister at the top of the pyramid. And his or her personality kind of dictates what the culture of the, uh, what the, uh, the church will look like. And it was, uh, you know, it was, so over time, the church has evolved to this day to the vision I've always had of this church. It's multicolored, multicolors. And uh, Thank you. <laughs> I thought I would add to your, uh, <laughs> to your idea about colors. And um, it's multi-denomin multi-denominational. There are people from all kinds of back religious backgrounds. It's a it's a very it's a wonderful melting pot of of very caring people. And uh, what was your experience of being the president of the board like? Well, I became president of the board during a tumultuous time in the ah. church's history. Mm -hmm. We had a minister that was not. Uh, well accepted by roughly half the congregation. So it became my charge and duty to evolve him out of the church. And that, that was a very stressful time for me and for the congregation to get past that uh, friction that was going on at the time. But we did it. I did it, I guess. And uh, you must have been quite a peacemaker in order to enable the, you know, that to happen. Well, you've got a lot of different constituencies in the yes. Unitarian Church. That is so true. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I got through it. Yeah. You know, I would say that that's actually true of um, any programming that we do, too, is like we uh, when I'm when I'm working on music, it's 
You know, one thing you don't want to do is kind of just have like a lowest common denominator of what is acceptable to everyone. Because I think that in that case, we would end up with not very much music and it would all kind of sound the same. So I'm going to go back to our true colors thing is that like when you're trying to have music, um, not that it's going to offend everyone equally, but that someone will find something to listen to in a service that resounds. Um, and then maybe if they don't like one piece, then if they wait, you know, five minutes, then they might really enjoy the next kind of repertoire because we are trying to include a multiple faith traditions, multiple styles of music. Yeah. And what about Gretchen when she was president? What was that time like? Well, she also went through a tumultuous time. Oh. Where they, were, they were talking about name changes of the church and the word church as part of the name was offensive to a, a, a part of the constituency of the church those of Jewish background and those uh, and, and others as well. We wanted to make the name more inclusive and uh, and more accepting of uh, people from all backgrounds. And uh, we ended up uh, with mixed success at that time and finally have evolved to what we have today. Which is a Beacon Unitarian Universalist congregation. Exactly. And that Thank really you, is- Because I forgot. It's really very, actually, if you think about it that way, that there was, that there were reasons, that it wasn't just like a name change, but that there were like reasons and history. I feel like it's important to keep that history known yeah. Yeah. because it just, you know, gives us more context, more depth to, to what the institution has gone through. Kathy, you have a question or a well, comment? I was just going to say the second time we tried to change the name, I was president of the board. Ah. Ah. Again, it was unsuccessful and... Uh, contentious for the same reasons. I'll mute now. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, Kathy's dog is a, a, the uh, fourth person in this <laughs> beating. <laughs> okay, so Vic, I, yeah. you have some gorgeous photos and I'd love it if you could start sharing your screen. And um, can you tell us uh, also as you're doing that, like how you started as a photographer? Like what, what was it that uh, caused you to even begin this craft? Well, I bought my first 35 millimeter camera in Japan in 1978. And uh, I took uh, hundreds of photographs on that trip and came back and paid uh, several hundred dollars to get all of those roles developed. And some of the photographs really looked pretty good to not only myself, but to other people who saw them. And over the years, I've gotten uh, encouragement and I've gotten involved with uh, jury shows over the years, and and um, it's a it's a hobby basically. But I have not really been actively taking photographs now for the last several years. So the photographs I'm going to show you today, there are about thirty of them, are just a potpourri of of various. Uh, and I'll give you a brief commentary on each of them. I know my time is limited, but I would like to say that the true storytelling potential of any photograph sits in the mind of the viewer, not the photographer. Each viewer is different and looks at the photo in a different way. So his or her mind is always in control of the ultimate meaning of the photograph. So if you just add enough mystery to the photo, the viewer fills in the blanks and potentially tells a much better story than the reality of the situation. So I just wanted to add those introductory words. That is very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, uh, that just makes me wonder about, um, you know, when a playwright uh, creates a play, how much, they're trying to be specific or how much they, a great play has a lot of different ways to reinterpret it. Well, it's like when you go to a museum and you stand, you look at an abstract painting, everybody who looks at that painting is looking at it through a different lens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's so, so interesting I, though, because like also, you know, when you're a performer of the play, one thing you want to do is be as specific as you can, even down to like a millisecond of you are not playing like, for instance, one intent or one emotion at the same time as the other, but the creation of it the, from the playwright side, it, it, it's so wide open. I, I never really thought about that before. 
Well, I'm also a former thespian, so I can relate to what you're saying. Yeah, because, you know, the performance of the script, the performance, it's uh, usually stronger when it's incredibly specific to the person who's giving it. But the, the materials that you work with uh, have so much possibility. So let's see what possibilities you're going to offer us today. OK, without further ado. This photograph uh, was taken probably eight or nine years ago. We had a vacation home in upstate New York on a little private lake. And uh, my son and I on New Year's Eve day went out um, in the evening of that day to uh, just take a ride. I had a new camera and came across this horse. We call this, I call this winter horse. And uh, that's the memory I have with my, my son on a uh, on a, a New Year's Day Eve that will be with me for the rest of my time here. And uh, so, and then on that same road, further down the road, oops. Sorry. You know, one thing you say, uh, as we're looking at that picture of the horse, actually, yeah. um, is that uh, I, I love the violet colored sky and the violet colored snow. I mean, it, it and, and I love that the horse is not violet because <laughs> it almost sta it pops out so much in terms of the color. It's such a strong contrast because everything that's um, sort of the farmer part, the man-made part of this picture looks gray. All, you know, the, um, the color of, of that uh, structure back there. But the horse is the one thing that's sort of a creamy yellow brown color. <laughs> Well, the, the horse also conveys a feeling of being very cold. It was a very cold evening and between the snow and the sky. And uh, I, I just I just feel a chill when I when I look at this as well. And I, I feel the chill and also I'm like looking at the the, um, the round puffy shapes in the sky and the kind of roundish shapes that are in the snow made by the horse's yeah. tracks and just like by the snow drifts. Yeah. And so I see like all these kind of like wavy lines in the sky and on the ground, but then I see the, uh, the barn there that's just so linear and um, un yielding and then in the background of that there looks like that kind of shed area also with those lines and then in the front the horizontal lines with the barbed wire it's kind of um a little bit i would say almost a little bit frightening looking yeah yeah well i just got a message that one person tried to get into the presentation and cannot get into it so hmm. i i just wonder what that's all about so on that same lake I was sitting in my living room and I got a call from a neighbor saying there was a blue heron making its way down uh, amongst the houses near, the, near the, the water. And I rushed out with my camera and stalked this, this creature and, and right in front of our house, he took off and he or she, and I was able to grab the, 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 this photograph. So. Um, and how many photographs did you take before and after this perfect shot? Oh, probably 15 or 20. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. so an automatic um, shutter motion. Well, it wasn't just, no, because I was taking him as he, as he was moving his way down the lake. So there were oh, some photographs okay. mm -hmm. I had of the, the heron on the ground. Mm -hmm. And this is the only flight picture I was able to get. Uh, you know, it was a kind of a lucky shot because... Uh, catching a bird in this position uh, is, is often a matter of luck. And did you say that it was all the same time as the horse picture? It, no, no. This okay, was, this is a different this one. Was summer. Okay, this okay. Was summer. yeah, yeah. I, I had another picture. I don't know if, I don't know if it's, no, it's not. I thought the okay. barn picture was here, but it's not. Okay. This picture is in the Galapagos Islands. And, and through the aperture of the rocks, is a is a landmark called Kicker Rock uh, in the Galapagos, and I was standing on a zodiac rubber raft, uh, which was tilting back and forth. So I had to take about also about a dozen or so images before this one was able to be retrieved. For me, what makes this picture so interesting is that it's um, well. There's a couple of things, and it's also about contrast. It's like 
the very dark foreground and middle ground on especially on my uh, to, to the left of the screen yes. where you can't really it's, it's so murky but then in the background it where the sun looks like it's hitting the water it, it's just white yeah um and yet it, I, I wonder what it would look like as, as a black and white photo um and then the other thing i see is like a uh, really still serene looking water in the background but in the front I, it I didn't really see this before when we've used this picture um, during our blue boat home for uh, Sunday service, but I see waves, <laughs> those little waves at the front with splashing. Probably from the, the Zodiac. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, and but similar to the horse, it's, it's interesting that there's a lot of gray and shades of gray, and then there's this brown tone. Mm -hmm. And so the right foreground is this beautiful ground similar to the horse with the with it as it turns out Vic told us the mud on the horse mm -hmm. I have a brown spotted horse but it's a muddy horse and Vic how much uh, color processing do you do how much do you um change the color and the tint and the tone it, it depends on the photograph and mm -hmm. I'm not a purist when it comes mm -hmm. to this there there are some digital photographers who only print or show what came through uh, the lens. Sometimes I use some post-processing uh, editing to make minor adjustments. And in one case, in the last photograph, a major adjustment to the image because very subjectively, I felt that that's what the image needed. And again, this whole process is a very subjective process. It's in the eye of, of the beholder, so to speak. Can and I'm I'm the one I'm the creator of the of the image. Therefore, I'm the I'm the the beholder who needs to be satisfied before he presents it to other people. Was that the the bird that you're talking about, the heron? The the heron. What about it? No, no I didn't. I one? didn't. This picture? Yeah, is that the one you? No, were no, no, no. It's it's the gusty hull. Oh, okay. The one that's in the in the. Uh, uh, in the church introductory to this Zoom meeting. Got it. Okay. Oh, right, right. Uh, yes, I'll have to show that at the end. Um, so right. this this is uh, <laughs> also in the Galapagos, uh, the uh, blue-footed booby, um, and their name, their their feet are. I I don't know why I like to say that. That's <laughs> part of my youth, I guess. So. Uh, Yep, um, and uh, I always wanted to put glasses on this bird uh, because it makes he looks so intelligent the way he's looking. Mm. Looks like a professor to me. That's my mental makeup story of this image. And how far away were you from this bird? Well, I had a uh, I have a uh, I had a long, heavy zoom lens on the camera, mm -hmm. so I was probably uh, forty or fifty yards away. So, okay, so now we just have to like actually put ourselves in context of, of Vic taking this photo because it looks like you were 12 inches away. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. with a zoom lens, you can do that. Also, in the mm -hmm. next photograph of, of two boobies uh, uh, facing in different in opposite directions, um, I printed this on metal. Uh, um, I, have, I have, and I use this in a, in a show uh, years ago that got pretty good uh, recognition. This and, is and such a beautiful photograph for so many reasons for me. Um, what, what are you, what are the main points for you? Well, I, I like the lava rock that they were sitting on, mm -hmm. which is the makeup of most of the Galapagos Islands. I like the composition of the, the two birds facing in exact opposite directions. And uh, the colors, I like the color of the sky, the color of the birds in the center with the brown tones and then the blackish tones of the base. And it just had a visual appeal to me. I, I like the reflection of the blue feet on the white. Yes, or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Isn't it amazing how those blue feet you know, because light reflects off of it and it shines onto the white bellies and it, it makes it look green. And I love the way that um, 
it looks symmetrical and like they're really facing opposite directions, but that one feather is sticking up. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like to make it a little bit asymmetrical. Uh, would you mind going back to the previous photo too? Because something about that really um, struck me is that I know that uh, because I dye fabrics is that um, if uh, it, looking at a color wheel, uh, which nowadays are uh, is considered like magenta, turquoise, and yellow. But if you look at the uh, that blue color, the opposite of that blue color on the color wheel is orange. So like what I think is really strong about this picture is that the two colors of the feet are totally separated on the color wheel and because that they contrast. You know, if the ground had a little bit more violet in it or if the feet had a little more green, it wouldn't be as strong. But I think because it it's, um, the eyes are process those colors so differently that looking at that picture, it just really pops out. And so when you look at the next picture, it's a little bit more kind of melded together. You know, mm -hmm. we don't have like uh, the blue background and like bright orange birds, but because of that, it seems more harmonious and they just seem a little bit more, I'm going to just say it like we're making them into people, a little more restful. <laughs> I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> That's, yeah. And this is an, also in the Galapagos. This is a Sally Lightfoot crab. And um, they are, they really do have these bright color tones and I did not do enhancement here. And the thing that I find interesting is, is, is in the physicality of the creature. If you look at the, the joint, it looks like a metal joint uh, and, and its legs and uh, claws. And the, that's really the natural uh, way that this, this uh, animal is, uh, is built. I really love the rocks, actually. Like, first of all, I think that that, that it looks like um, someone dipped that in paint. <laughs> uh, it, uh, the whole thing looks like it's just been painted. And I think it's, a, w what a testament to nature that, you know, it stands out like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kathy, what about your experience at taking photographs when you were well, in the Galapagos I like, just a year there, ago? I only saw uh, those from very far away. And so I was telling Vic, I need to get a copy of this because I didn't get any photos like that. Mine were so far away and I don't have a telephoto. And so I, I could not get them. And I did not see these colors, which not only are outrageous, but they're reflected in those rocks. You know? Unbelievable. Yeah. So I'm sorry, did you say how far away you were from this, Vic? I, I honestly, I can't remember Misa, I, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, with a telephone, telephoto lens, you have a lot of options between, a, between the original image and the ability to crop the photo. Yeah, and yeah. You, you, you've got a lot of opportunities to create this kind of an image. You're almost like a wildlife paparazzi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you say so. <laughs> Okay. Well, we move, we move on to Jordan <gasps> and this is the road to Petra. And uh, so Petra is an ancient city. It's you'll see in a couple of pictures that goes back to the fourth century BC. And it was settled by the Nabataeans, um, which uh, they were very wealthy traders and they built a trading hub in the desert on, in sandstone, in the mountains of the desert uh, that you'll see in a moment. And um, so, but these two young women, young girls were on the road to Petra, which is, was about a mile and a half from where the bus dropped us off. And it was about a 95 degree day. And these girls were selling postcards. And the girl on the right with the blue uh, headscarf uh, was very wary of me. and. Her friend on the left was a little more open, and you can see that the difference in their in their expressions. You know that blue looks like the blue footed booby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, not too not too far off. It's it's uh, I love that color, and I love how you really stood them out from a background by because the background is not in focus and it's a bit washed out, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Um, kind of uh, once again like separating the foreground from the background using 
light. Yes. And I also called, love. Go it's ahead. called boca, boca. Uh, the 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 washing out of the background in favor of the foreground. Yeah, and as Laura Kramer just said, though their eyes are lined up on the same plane, yes. and so uh, you can immediately see, like the the uh, more openly yeah. uh, friendly person, like her, she has a smile, but then we see like the mouth on the slightly and more the suspicious eyebrow. girl, <laughs> just like not with the same curved smile, exactly. but kind of clinging eyebrow. to her friend there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was quite a, an interesting little, uh, little contact that we had on the way. <laughs> uh, and I, this picture is, I converted it to black and white and it's hanging on my living room wall. I have to say, I love the colors in this. And the other, the other thing I, I know that um, a lot of people these days for their Zoom meetings, they're, they're getting um, ring lights and different uh, LED lights in order to yes. light themselves. And one thing that you always uh, try to do when you're uh, showing the faces, show lights in the eyes. And I see yeah. natural lights in the eyes here. Because I mean, right. you didn't use a flash of any no. kind or no, no fill flash or anything like that. Yeah. No. So it's just like sunlight. Yeah. Is making their eyes kind of twinkle. Now, j just past this, where these two girls were sitting, this is what the road into Petra looks like. And uh, what the Nabataeans did, you can't have a, a city in, in desert mountains unless you're able to have water. And what they did is they harvested rainwater from outside the city via dams cisterns and water conduits cut into the rock. So if you see the cuts in the rock on each side of the path, the, that actually uh, transported water into the city. And it was kind of a wonderful uh, engineering feat that these people had uh, back in the fourth century BC. So we ain't as smart as we think we are sometimes. There were. There were a lot of very intelligent people that go way back in, in, in the history. And look at the greenery at the top, the foliage yeah. that shows you there's a water source now. Yeah. And as you continue around the curves in the road, all of a sudden you come to this, which is the first glimpse of the most famous of the uh, sandstone carvings in Petra called the treasury. And, uh, and that was the first look that you have, first image of the treasury after winding around all of these paths on a, on a very hot day. What I liked about the previous picture as well, Vic, is that we could see the people there. So it gives you yeah. a sense of the scale because yeah. uh, uh, it's great to see this picture first and then the second one, because now I realize uh, how massive of an undertaking this all must it have was. been. It was massive. Mm -hmm. And then when you get, a, when you get through the the, the 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 rocks to the other side this is kind of what you're facing and uh, that's the treasury and uh you can see the the little horse carts that some people hired to get them down the road so they didn't have to walk as long in the 95 degree heat and the treasury itself is not deep you really can't go in there they built it more for the facade than for a purpose. Uh, the purpose was the facade, apparently. And that the way is that, so interesting. Yeah. You know, um, it reminds me actually of, of going to Wall Street in the financial district in New York City, because it's, you know, they always say that the uh, New York is canyons, yes. but it's gray canyons. Yeah. And uh, this is not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I've got a and, and this previous ones because I think previous. What I love about this picture is the the, the silhouette. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> the silhouette. Got it. <laughs> I, it does, it, you know, okay, now I'm going to say, just anal analyzing it, the reason that it looks like it's a very vibrant picture is you see how on both sides of the reveal, you, you have the, the dark lines that are kind of 
um, parallel to each other. So we have something that looks like this and then down. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, so it's like a window, but the window is not straight. On one side, it comes in, on the other side, at the same time, it goes out. So we have yeah. this kind of like window uh, that's bent and, and very yeah. organic looking because of the striations, I guess, of the yeah. rock there. Yeah, that's right. Mm. So we were vacationing in the Adirondacks with friends who had a home on one of the many lakes in the Adirondacks. And I came down early in the morning and the mist was on the lake and this dock loon was attached to their dock. And the cobwebs and the mist of the morning uh, gave me this image. And then I turned in the opposite direction and saw this, which was, uh, uh, which for me is a very restful picture. And this is hanging on the wall in my den. I love this picture. I love that the foreground is so, again, mysteriously dark and also, I would say, it, to me, it looks a little foreboding. Yeah. Um, but we do see that there's like nature and growth and like new growth on the um, shrubbery, but then yeah. uh, almost an ethereal background. Yeah, it's, it's very, it, for me, it conveys a very restful feeling. It's like something I can look at and meditate to. Yeah, I could see that. Mm -hmm. To me, yeah. it looks like um, mysterious waiting, something <laughs> ready to happen. That's what it looks like. I, maybe because the fog is going to lift, or something. And that's why I said in the in the beginning of the presentation that it's in the eye of the beholder. You're making I, up your own stories about I this. I am. I'm making up a good one too. Good, good. This is in Greece. It's in Mykonos. And this is hanging in my powder room and off my kitchen. This is blue blanket and in Mykonos uh, as another and Santorini as well. Uh, the buildings are all blue and white from the Greek flag. And uh, you know, can I just say again, I'm just go back again. Once again, it's not by uh, no, I'm sorry to the Greek one. It's not by an accident that people are using blue and orange as contrast together. And that goes like yeah. the blue sky and the yeah. terracotta pottery at the bottom. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. The orange and the mm -hmm. blanket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Exactly, yeah. So uh, in, uh, we were having uh, cocktails at a cafe down by the water and the owner, the father of the owner of the cafe was this guy. And he looks like he's right out of central casting. He's got his coffee, his pipe, his lighter, his keys, his Greek fisherman hat, his walking stick. He's got a very, you can see that he's got a very positive self image. And uh, I just, I just love, uh, from a people looking perspective, I just loved his face. And this is the first black and white one we've seen from you as well. It's so the it, only, it's the only one in the group. Yeah, and it um, just looking at that, I think that um, it makes my eye look at different things. Like I'm looking yeah. at the keys. Are they keys yeah. that are attached there? To, yeah. and, and the way it kind of gleams and I'm looking at the shadows, which I have not actually noticed in any of their photos. And I think that um, when you take away all color that you start really noticing shapes yeah. like that, like shadows and, and um, keys and the way his kind of right hand is is it holding a lighter? Cigarette lighter, yeah. Cigarette lighter, a, yeah. It's kind of like clenched around that cigarette lighter. Yeah. Hmm. This was taken at a place called Millbrook Village, which is down near the Delaware Water Gap on, on the Jersey side. And this is hanging in Emily Bogus's home. And you can see it behind her often on a Sunday morning. And, I'll have to look. Yes, that's a wonderful. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I went down there and, and spent the, an afternoon with another photographer to learn some different techniques. I've taken a number of different lessons over my life. And this was a one day lesson and Millbrook Village was a, was a great uh, source of images for me. 
I've got a number of them, but this is the only one that's in this little presentation. Now, I've had a coffee table book for years called Maasai about the Maasai people who live in Tanzania and Kenya. And my wife sent me, and she knew I wanted to travel to Africa on a photographic safari. And she gave me the safari as a gift. And uh, I went, uh, I signed up for the trip. There were supposed to be eight people in the Land Rover. And as we got closer to my uh, departure date, I found out that I was the only one who signed up. And I became the only one on the trip. They went ahead with the trip, even though they only had one person. And my guide, M. Tilly, on the left-hand side, uh, he thought he was 65 years old at the time. We became brothers on the second day of our time together. There was 10 days in country. And years later, I connected with his son, um, whose his name is Bakari, who is a graduate student at a, uh, at a university in Tanzania to learn about uh, conservation. And uh, next to uh, Mtili on the left is Gamba on the right. And he was uh, he was my escort up the uh, the uh, the side of the Ngorongoro crater, which was a very steep crater, and the paths along the way it's about a fifteen hundred to two thousand foot climb, and Cape Buffalo, which are very dangerous, uh, often are on these trails, and he was there with his automatic rifle to protect me in the event that we got into a situation that became dangerous. I was going to say, it doesn't look like a walking stick. <laughs> like, well, a, yeah. well, the one on the left is a walking yes, stick. The one yes. on the right is an automatic rifle. And the Ngorongoro crater, which is this image, um, it's about a two and a half million year old crater, volcanic crater. It's about 1,500 to 2,000 feet deep. It's about a hundred square miles. And the caldera or the, the base of the, uh, the crater is 10 to 12 miles across in many places. And it's quite a, uh, it's quite a, a place. There are, there are herds of various kinds of animals down below. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's one of the uh, wonder, not the wonders of the world, I forgot what the term was, but and way across the crater, you can see uh, that's a car moving along. You can see the dust. Oh, yeah. The car. Uh huh. So you can get an idea of the scope and, and distance. So you know what I. Yeah, and, and I love in this photo also that the, all the lines are sideways, all the lines are horizontal. It just makes you think that it is a gigantic, wide place. It is. It is uh, very, it's very gigantic. And can I just say that because uh, you, you'll see how like my mind is working. Like I see the clouds are just pretty much a straight horizontal line. Then we yeah. have the mountain or the hills, which is like the, the background, which is kind of phased down on one side of the screen. But then you have in the foreground, this green, the brighter green thing, which actually goes in a slightly opposite direction, kind of like it's going in the opposite way, like heading down towards the other side of the screen. And I think that those those angles balance each other out to make it pleasing to the eye and also make it like, um, you know, dynamic. Yep. Well, well uh, down below, oh, excuse me, up on the top of the crater, a Maasai uh, warrior took me on a hike. And he's looking at me with a smile on his face because I was prevailing on him to step back from the edge because he is literally down below there is a very tall tree down there. That tree is very, very tall at the bottom. He's standing about 1500 feet and his feet, his sandals are just at the edge of going over, over into the <laughs> abyss. So he was smiling at me because I was saying, please, you're making me very nervous. And his body I, language is so relaxed. Like his yes. shoulders aren't like, you know, um, being held tightly. He just looks like he's just hanging out there with his beautiful textile 
rap. Well, he's used to the terrain. So it was, mm -hmm. that was his, I was on his turf. And uh, so he was very familiar with the, with the, uh, the landscape. Look at the way his walking stick kind of um, extends the length of his body. Yep. It's like if you see his his own left leg is slightly forward and the walking yep. stick, it like parallels that, but makes it even farther down. So it makes him look very tall. Yeah, he is tall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Maasai but, are generally tall people. But the way you either cropped it uh, originally or when you uh, kind of edited it, then you see the tree in the background, which also is like also extends the line from the yep. bottom of his walking stick through his body all the way to that branch in the corner. Yeah. Well, down below, this was in the Serengeti, actually, not far from, from the Ngorongoro crater. This lioness was hunting, and she had two lion cubs off behind her, which are on a separate photograph. And the lioness was watching a herd of zebra approaching a water hole. And water holes are the most dangerous place for prey animals in Africa. And the zebra were very tentative and very nervous. And one zebra marched to the head of the line and started toward the water. And all of the other zebra fell in behind. And the next shot was the reflection of the zebras drinking when they got there. And about 10 <laughs> seconds, about 10 seconds after I took this photograph, the lioness jumped out from the bush and started uh, uh, chasing the zebra one of, and trying to get one for a meal for herself and her cubs. Okay, just let's, uh, um, just let's look at this picture. I'm fascinated by it. It's all those zebras are making circles with their own reflections. Yes. So you have like lines from the zebras, but like circles after circle after circle. And then we have like the greenish sort of, I get greenish brown on the top, but the blue at the bottom. That is remarkable. Well, after, uh, after the zebras got away, this one looked back and said, catch you later, lady. <laughs> Not this time. And then I, and, and then I ran into a, a remarkable animal. You don't see them very often. A three-headed zebra. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't Obviously. realize that zebras have red, red on their noses like that. <laughs> well, it's brownish red and mm -hmm. uh, yes. And I did pump up a little bit on the saturation here, but I, mm -hmm. I, thought, it be, I thought it was an interesting picture of the three zebra heads. Yeah, it is interesting because even like it, it just gives you like three perspectives, it, it, like you photoshopped and just layered them on each other. But I realized yeah. that they were just standing in a way that it yeah. was like the natural way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, when you're when you're one person in a Land Rover and, and just you and the guide, you have the option to, to stay as long as you want in a particular place without having six or seven other people in the Land Rover uh, press you for moving on. And this, there are two rhinoceros, black rhinoceros, which are almost extinct. They were almost a mile away on this very flat terrain. And through my binoculars, I saw them and I said to Emtili, I said, why don't we just stay here and, and see if they amble toward us? And it took about 45 minutes for this guy to separate from the other one. And he walked right in front of our Land Rover. You know, it's it's remarkable that you had the chance to go and that 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 um, Manasseh like walked up to you, but it, just the way that you can use your photographs to like show us like kind of like how one of a kind moment that was because not everyone gets to go on, you know, that kind of expedition and then to have the luxury of being the only person to just spend 45 minutes waiting. Yeah, yeah. became and, the trip and, of a yeah. lifetime. It, yeah, and that picture shows it. Yeah. And the next shot is Gretchen, my wife's favorite picture. It's a, it was a grab shot out of a moving Land Rover in Arusha, which is a city in Tanzania. And my wife loves this picture. And uh, there are a couple of people in the congregation who have this hanging in their homes as well. 
It's beautiful. And that dress looks like it's grass. <laughs> it looks like it's made yeah. of the grass color. <laughs> yeah. And I love the way the, the, the little girl's feet are moving and the, the movement of her, her green dress. Mm -hmm. It just and the and the mother holding her hand. It just it's just a very noble picture for me. Noble mm -hmm. image. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. It, this is in, Mar in uh, Martha's Vineyard. I spent a week there with Allison Shaw, who's a vineyard photographer. And this is in Oak Bluffs. And um, this was part of a series of photographs I took that won first prize at a juried show in upstate New York called Reflections. That picture we have seen at Beacon in yeah. uh, also in the Blue Boat home. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the dock on the right hand side I stepped onto the dock and I saw this, which I thought became an interesting uh, juxtaposition of images. The only thing real in this photograph is this part of the dock. Everything else, the black portion is the underside of the dock and the reflection is the sky above in the water. That is amazing. You know, just uh, thinking about it in terms of the color, in terms of the uh, uh, linear images, in terms of like not knowing what is real and yeah. uh, what's a reflection. Yeah. Yeah. I I I feel like we are um, almost out of time. So okay. is there a last photo that you want to show us? I mean, I could sit here for hours. This is the one where I use the um, okay, yeah. light as uh, subjective with the with the pumping up of the uh, the saturation i have this one hanging in my home as well it looks like a painting um because this is of the reflection Menem menemsha which is a, one of the most photographed towns in martha's vineyard i and, and again same thing you know we're just talking about in a different way i i could Definitely see a photography of yours with, on color and reflection. Yeah. Um, because I feel like that's a theme that we've seen in a lot of your photographs is like uh, how light reflects. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so Gene Crichton says my, wonderful that's pictures. My story. Uh, I, I'm so thrilled to have heard your story. Um, Jean says, wonderful pictures, remarkable. And Laura said, it's an abstract painting. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, if people have questions and, uh, you know, uh, you can ask them, uh, we could stay on for a couple more minutes more, but um, I see over your right shoulder, we the uh, we see the picture from the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Vic, I would love to see more of your work. Yes. Well, you're I... just a terrific audience, I'm telling you. <laughs> I, 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 I find it very difficult to be objective about my photographs. It's because I, I can't, and it's all in the eye of the people who are looking at it that determine whether or not it has meaning or value. And I've seen your pictures at the church when we have had, uh, you know, uh, whatever, programs. Yeah. And, but I, I have to say that listening to you talk about them and then having an opportunity to talk about some of the colors and the design, the patterns, it just adds so much more to each of those pictures. Well, thank you. Well, excuse me, one of the t attendees asked if I had a website. I do, but it's, it's not fully up to date, but it's vicrosenbergphotography.com. Okay. And uh, I'm, it's been a long time since I, I really did work on it. The cover page has images of Israel and Jordan and, uh, and, old, and the old city of Jerusalem. So, um, but the, there are albums where you can see uh, most, most or all of the other, and other photographs that were not shown today. All right, great. Well, you know, Vic, this is not gonna be the last time we talk to you because this is absolutely fascinating. And uh, um, yeah, I love seeing things through your eye, like hearing your stories through your photographs. And I feel like my life is actually a little bit enriched just oh. from being able to, to talk with you. Well, be still my heart. Thank you for your, <laughs> thank you for your positive comments. 
really, I appreciate it. I'm going to be seeing blue and orange continuously. In every I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, I think that we should look for colors now in our in our um, in our daily lives as we go around. You know, it's just to see our true colors. Yeah, and we're going. This is what we're going to do. We're going to see our true colors, and we're going to talk to Vic at some point again in the future because we want to hear your story. And um, Vic, I'm actually going to talk to you right away about the cabaret because we're doing an art project, and now I, you, you just have to. You, you're not going to have any choice. You have to participate. <laughs> So uh, I'll get Jean and Laura and Judy and Deborah Graham to all, uh, yeah, uh, convince you how you're going to participate in that. Okay. <laughs> thank, thanks. Thank you all those of you who were who were looking at these. Uh, thank you for being there. It was a pleasure. So um, all right, we're all going to go on and have our creative lives, and okay. I will see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.